Pennies Going In Raw is a production of iHeartRadio. The opinions expressed in the following podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide education and entertainment about the financial industry and the stock market. Enjoy! On this episode of Pennies Going In Raw, we discuss the state of the market after a three-day weekend. You find out life's this game of pennies. Oh, you guys know we only have a 40% runner. Hello? 40% right is a f***ing killing. We've been compliant for too long. It's time we go to war. I don't have a Roth. You know so much about the market that his brain doesn't have enough room for grammar. Hey, who told me about Idex? It's going up a shit ton now. We're up 4%, baby. No way. 4 fucking percent. You asked the exact same question with two words <laughs> different. It's like, f- man, I just got dick whipped for like... 20% and now that f***er's up like 50. I bet Warren Buffett never did that. I'm just making this voice memo to call out unusual whales to a fight. The pennies we need are everywhere around us. Pennies. 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 Going in raw. Featuring Dan, Deity of Dips, and Hugh Honey. Produced by Vinny and Christian. Let's, Let's go, go, baby. Welcome back to another episode of Pennies Going In Raw. Today is Wednesday, first day of June, uh, going into a very new month. And by today, you know, it opened down. Uh, You talked about it last time. You said if it opened up like five to ten points, it's definitely a short for you. If it opened down, you would go long, at at least for the short term. Um, Yeah. And today it opened around 4.10. And as we're recording this around an hour before market close, it's around 4.15. It peaked around 4.17. So it would have been decent long if you were playing options or whatever. Um, Is that kind of what, I mean, it happened just, I mean, you gave two scenarios and one happened and that's exactly what, I mean, what happened is what you expected. Uh, What kind of led you to seeing that? And did you make that play? I mean, if you're looking at it's only a, Four five dollar increase, but on spy that's massive, especially if you're playing options, same day option or like tomorrow or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. So what I actually ended up doing was I actually went short off open, and then um, and then basically I was trying to go long, but um, some of the indicators that I use were saying that it was basically a, a little bit into overbought territory. So what I was really really hoping for was a pretty big gap down to that like really 408 and kind of like it would reset some of the market indicators. That's what I was really looking for. And so we didn't have that. And in uh, the way that I played the trade and I tweet about it, but um, but we can go over here is that um, is that I had pretty big support at that 412 mark um, and that 412 mark. I mean, right off open, we pretty much broke through that pretty fast and I could just see the selling. So um, so I, I had texted like a few of my friends and just said like, hey, listen, uh, and this was about um, this was about like uh, like nine o'clock in the morning, so like half an hour before market opened, and I had said, "Hey, listen, you know, I think they're going to start trying to close the gap on spy to the upside. Um, you know, if they try and close this gap, and uh, and right before right into market open, they start to sell it. You know, I'll go short, especially if it breaks through that uh, four twelve area. You know, looking for like four ten and four oh seven, and so basically." Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. And so um, I really like when when my thesis, um, you know, like I, like I never really try and uh, what's what I'm trying. To, I'm, not, I'm not trying to predict the market, but when I have a thesis laid out and um, and that comes to fruition, you know, that's when I that's when I can go, you know, a little bit heavier and I can size a little bit and um, and really have confidence in that play. So, you know. Short at 412, I covered some, you know, 41050, a few more at like 41030, and then got stopped out at 411. I was like I said, is that I wanted originally to to get that long. However, however, uh, it just didn't happen um, because some of the indicators that I used were saying overbought. And so, you know, it still was obviously a pretty good long, but um, you know, I gotta respect the strategy. And so that's what I did. And uh, overall, it was a pretty easy Tuesday. Um, you know, I, I only did about 30% of my goal um, that I 
you know, pretty much set every day. But uh, but that's one of those things where, you know, it is what it is and and I'm okay with it. So, uh, you know, really good overall. And I think that uh, that that we're going to get a pretty good opportunity. Like we're kind of staying inside a range, which inside this market we haven't really seen too much of. And so I'm excited to see uh, to see like, you know, some movement. I think um, I think later in the week it'll probably come. Yeah, I was. Uh, we're like we're recording this an hour early uh, today because our big sports fan Hugh is going to a <laughs> Mets game today. Um, oh, yeah. But do you kind of expect the bigger move? I, I kind of expect. I mean, after today's kind of sideways action, you'd expect it to really make the decisive move uh, either tomorrow or Thursday. Do you have any expectations on that? And do you have a similar plan like you gave on? you know, last week's episode. Yeah. So currently, as long as the shorter term indicators um, continue to stay overbought, I'll only look to short. Um, so like me personally, I want to see sub 410 before I even consider going long again. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that spy can't go long, but currently with like the indicators I use and stuff like that, it's, um, it, it's, it's at a point to where it's so overbought that, you know, that, that the risk to reward for me isn't there to go long. So I would only be considering going short, um, which I think that, you know, like I said, is that 408, 409 is somewhere where I'd be thinking about, you know, or 407 really where, where maybe, you know, some of the indicators change and they reset a little bit. Um, that's what I think would be important. Now, as far as, as far as, um, the rest of the week goes, now t- today at 1:30 Eastern time, uh, I believe I believe it was early in the day, but 1:30 Eastern time, um, Biden and Powell uh, finished up their meeting. Now there's a pretty big misconception here that I saw on Twitter, which I kind of wanted to, to talk about in the pod today, which is that Powell and Biden meeting is a really good thing for the stock market. That's not necessarily how I see it. Um, you know, there, there's a few things to take into consideration. It's not it's not super un- uncommon for uh you know the head of the Fed and uh and the president to meet um you know I believe Trump met with him twice and uh obviously during 2008 uh you know I mean the Fed and the president were having a t- uh, you know a few meetings so it's not like super uncommon it's just you know typically the Fed as it's supposed to is supposed to act as its uh, as its own you know third party and uh, and not be influenced, but you know a meeting really isn't a big deal. I would love to see the the meeting minutes from that meeting, as I expect that it's uh, that it's probably pretty interesting. Um, but as far as those two meeting, it's important to note that um, that the big misconception is that this is really good for the stock market, and in my opinion, I think. Biden's number one goal right now is to lower inflation. I think that's his only goal. Um, and so when we look at inflation, you know, if, if when we look at inflation, the one thing that uh, that lowers inflation is going to be raising rates and being really uh, what's the word I'm looking for is being um, I don't want to say cautious, but but uh, to to be aggressive with uh it's raising like interest office. rates yeah 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 and so and so if biden is asking Powell to to make sure that the next cpi um uh that that if the next cpi is let's just say you know doesn't show a big improvement if he's talking to him like hey you know if that's the true if that's actually what's going on um you know that inflation isn't coming down you know you need to be aggressive uh, on the next on the next rate hike, that's not you know something that that the stock market's going to really want to see. Um, so that's why I say that you know I don't really believe that that's super bullish for the market. Those two meeting, as I said, I believe that um, I, I believe that uh, that that Biden's main concern is lowering inflation. And so if you know, next inflation data is not significantly lower. Like I'm talking sub seven, you know, sub six and a half percent. Then, um, then he's going to look to Powell to be aggressive. And uh, Powell, Powell, you know, if he if he's aggressive, you know, that's where we start talking about like hundred basis points. And then that's when you know we've doubled 
interest rates inside the past few months, you know, 100 basis points would really put a reckoning on uh, on interest rates. So uh, that's the one thing that that I would say, you know, and, and the other thing to note is that we have to remember that a majority of America um, is does not really have a large amount of their net worth tied up in the stock market. Yeah. So the one thing to note here is that uh, is that majority of the stock market is actually owned by uh, by boomers. <laughs> uh, boomers are a large, yeah, and, and that makes sense. The four hundred one k is building up. <laughs> exactly, and so that that makes a. Uh, that that makes some um, total sense, you know, the, that the boomers own a majority of the stock market. So it's really not like you're millennials. And honestly, the other parts of this, which, you know, like the boomers never really had to deal with, or, or I don't want to say deal with, but um, never really had the option was um, alternative. There's so many alternative uh, investment classes now. I mean, look at crypto. I mean, I mean, if you if you were to ask, if you were to ask, <clears throat> if you were to ask the average um, millennial, do they have more money in in crypto, real estate, or the stock market, or like none at all? I would bet that it would be pretty close between having. Uh, I, I would say that they probably have a similar amount in crypto as they do the stock market. I think that, yeah. like you know, just yeah. just taking a poll on like some of my friends and stuff, you know. Yeah, what no, do you I mean, think? Uh, shit. Um, most. What is the demographic we're trying to we're discussing? Well, I'm just saying that, like in general, like millennials, like I think that I think that you know, I mean, boomers. You ask them if they have, uh, you know, they can the it, how much they have in crypto versus how much they have in in the stock market. I would bet it'd be like you know, probably two hundred thousand dollars for every one dollar in crypto or something. You know, where yeah, 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 no, for well, sure. Uh. For if we're taking the whole demographic, uh, thing is, I just don't think there's as much money in crypto. I mean, I think we're underestimating the amount of money that's in stocks, though. But um, no, yeah, def- definitely a shit ton more. Of fuck, it's it's difficult to think about just because of how new crypto is. But if we're saying like who owned, I'd say eighty percent of people that aren't like whales of it owned by millennials is that fair uh okay but, yeah, yeah makes i sense. think you gotta yeah, yeah, think yeah. like there's gotta be like like doug bonaparte owns a fucking dick load of it and well i guess he'd be a millennial too huh but <laughs> uh yeah you're probably on like the old <laughs> the, <laughs> Wait, the older end of the millennial side yeah no no and, and the other point about the about the stock market is just that um is that the top 10 percent uh, held seventy percent of the total U.S. net worth, um, which is pretty wild, uh, and and the top one percent held about half of that. So they held about third. So the top one percent holds about a third of the U.S. wealth. So that that's kind of where I was saying, like you know. So if we take the top ten percent, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna estimate that of the top ten percent, you know, n- not very much of, of that top ten percent is millennials. And uh, so that means that only that only about thirty percent of the U.S. wealth is left um, outside of that top ten percent. And so my point to all this is that um, is that the boomers own most of the stock market, and uh, and they're not necessarily like the average like you know the average millionaire I think becomes a millionaire at fifty five or something. So it, it's not one of those things where um, where you know there's just like like the boomers are the ones who, in my opinion, really kind of, you know, they had to handle the dot com bubble. They had to handle 2008. Um, you know, they had to handle, I guess, a majority had to handle, um, you know, Black Monday. But for the most part, they've kind of done it right, if you will, as far as like the slow growth, growth metrics. Um, and so it's really cool to see. But again, is that, you know, they've never really had crypto or like this alternative asset class to invest in. And, uh, and we did. And I know that especially like inside the past few years, you know, that asset class has <laughs> like, yeah, it's done some 10 stuff. X. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's 10 X in size of market, it's 10 X in popularity. I mean, just all over the board. So, um, so with that being said, 
I think that um, that that's another struggle. And I'll be interested to see, you know, when when me and Dan are old and gray, you know, how that kind of changes things. Because one of the things that we always talk about, well, not just us, but everybody always talks about is starting investing early. Well, if I were to take like, let's just say that thousand bucks a month that, you know, my aunt wanted me to put inside the market. Um, if I put that instead inside crypto, you know, how does that change things a little bit down the line? You know, because again, is that is that typically everybody who says, you know, invest early, invest often. And um, and so does that, I, I wonder two things. One, obviously, it depends on, um, you know, on on the success of crypto. Dude, the maybe when people are years. saying in, when they're saying invest early and often, they're not meaning invest like at an early age They're saying when shit's brand new, just invest in it. And we yeah, were just awesome. misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't lose. Yeah, I mean, we're genius. So we're sponsoring a soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so so I wonder if that will change things, you know, for, because I like I said, is that I know friends who literally cashed out like their bonds that their grandmother gave them to uh, to buy, buy the stock market. I mean, buy uh, crypto and stuff. So I think that it'll be really interesting to see. You know, like I said, is that right now the average millionaire I think is made around fifty five years old or something. And and again, is that the current boomers that we're seeing? You know, we saw that slow growth. Um, you know, invest correctly, invest early, invest often, and eventually you'll become a millionaire, really pay out for a large majority of that uh, age group. Um, but again, is that I'll, uh, I'll wonder how it works out for, uh, for, you know, my friends who instead of investing inside the stock market um, at this age, you know, we're investing in crypto, you know, to, and, and again, is that most of that lies largely on the success of crypto inside the next 40 to 50 years. But it could be something where, you know, um, where, where, where we see a difference in, um, in, in that age of, of millionaires. And also, you know, I think it's like, uh, I, wait, let me look up the stat, but I believe one in every 10, okay. Dude, it's gonna it's gonna go from like millionaires being like this elite like class of people that you know like you think work so hard to being these fucking guys from Reddit that just uh, invested in crypto early or just like <laughs> <laughs> bought a shit ton of weed on Silk Road when they were young. I'm like, fuck, I sell fourteen bitcoins. Yeah, yeah, literally, exactly. Like that's how it's gonna be. That that's yeah. <laughs> It's gonna, um, it's gonna be like the middle class is gonna be like the class everyone's like, oh yeah, these are the sophisticated like. <laughs> so, uh, so that means that so basically, just over eight percent of Americans are millionaires. You know, in fifty years, I'm gonna come back to this podcast episode because it will be interesting well, um, to see if years, that number. The, well, I mean, fifty years after inflation, and everything we'll probably be having millionaires fresh out of college. <laughs> Probably, honestly. Yeah, so maybe it's like billionaires it's already, or something. It's already like what? I, I was reading one article where I think it was from like just like 2000 or like 1995, like in my lifetime. And it was like he spent this much and it was in parentheses in today's value. And it was already doubled. I was like, dude, it's, I have it's like 25 years. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so so I, I said that the average millionaire was 55. Um, and this is right off of uh, uh, sped, spedmont.com. It's a blog. According to a report about the U.S. millionaire population by age, the average age of U.S. millionaires is 62 years old. Um, only 1% are below 35. So that's pretty crazy to think about. Only 1% are below 35. Uh, that, that's, wow. That's kind of wow. Um, also, you know, just, you know, Wow, that's uh, you just fucking wow. You're, wow, we got this, a long time till thirty five too. Honestly, you, I mean, you do. Oh my god, like eight, seven or eight more years, man. That's still a pretty long time. Yeah, I, mean, I only no, got twelve got years left. left. Uh, but no, it's it. It's I mean, it, it's really not as surprising, I think, as you'd think. I mean, they're fucking thirty five is only what seventeen years in the workforce, assuming you don't even go to college which yeah so 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just to like kind of wrap this up, because I know like, yeah, I kind of been rem- rambling about this. It's just that I think that, um, I think that, I think that it's interesting because I saw a lot of people thinking that um, that Powell meeting um, meeting with Biden was bullish, and I just I just don't see it that way. Um, again, I think that his main concern is uh, is to lower inflation, and uh, and and to do that, you know, they they're going to have to be more aggressive, or, or you know, let's see how the next inflation report is. But um, overall, they're probably going to have to be more aggressive to to lower inflation. And um, and and the and the biggest thing about that is that you know who does inflation hit the hardest? You know, and and we talked about this on the last episode a little bit. But inflation hits the hardest like the people who live paycheck to paycheck because again that grocery bill goes from two hundred to uh, to to three hundred, or uh, or you know that gas bill typically forty dollars is now eighty dollars, and so that's who it hits the hardest is like the people who um, you know really live paycheck to paycheck. And not necessarily the people that are putting, you know, 25, 30 percent of their net worth inside the stock or, you know, 25, 30 percent of their income every year into the stock market. Um, and so that's why I actually instead of this not being bullish, I actually think it's, you know, it's, it's relatively not good for the stock market if um, if that is, in fact, um, what happened at the meeting. And again, I would love to see the minute notes. Um, you know, I'll keep my eyes peeled for him. If you guys end up seeing the minutes or something, you know, shoot them inside my DMs. Um, because I think that this is something that actually will, although it's just a meeting, this is something that that could potentially uh, change. Um, it, it could, could put either a, either a dent in the market or, um, you know, give it a nice uh, green, another big green candle, you know? Yeah. And okay, so I know you wanted to touch on oil, um, which has been like a hot topic during the Russia Ukraine thing. Now, I mean, which is also funny. We've gone from being like, oh, Ukraine or Russia, like such dicks for invading Ukraine to like, damn, Russia, maybe pussy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they can't like get this done with low key, kind of weak. Uh, no offense to our Russian listeners. Um, I don't know. Can't. Can we be offensive to Russian listeners during this? I think most Russians are kind of not a fan of what's going on too. So no, no, <laughs> not a large majority. And if you are, I don't care about offending you. Probably, yeah, <laughs> respectfully. Um, yeah, I'm sure you have your. You can send your voice recording in as to why this is a good thing. Um, <laughs> all right, so you wanted to touch on oil, uh, which hasn't really been as hot of a topic since, um, uh, you know, the beginning of the Ukraine Russia conflict, but. What is it going on now that you have to fucking let people know about? Yeah, this is going to be one expensive summer because oil is staying above this 110, 120 area for far too long. And, um, and I mean, if you go back and look at, if you go back and look at, um, and look at, um, you know, historical data, anytime that oil stays above 100, 110 for this long, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's almost always an indicator. One, one ten for, of what? One ten a barrel. Okay, okay. Um, it, you know, it, uh, it, it almost always uh, points towards like an early recession. And, um, and, and, and that's the thing is that, is that this is just, you know, there's so many things that, that play a key part into this. Um, but the one thing that I will say is that oil staying up here is not good for anybody like i understand that uh that you know we have a lot of uh you know a lot of oil investors who are just making a killing right now and you know i i get that you know especially because at one time oil was negative with wild uh you know oil not too long ago was in the single digits so you know listen it, you got to take the good with the bad etc but that being said i mean this is not good for 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 the summer um everything's going to be more expensive but the amount that the that the world relies on oil i i can't even begin to to kind of go into detail how yeah, Elon much Musk is going to need to hurry the fuck up with the whole tesla yeah thing. i mean we literally use oil for everything like everything and so with oil being up here, I mean, even, even the price difference between $85 a barrel to $110 a barrel is like billions. 
Like, uh, like it, it's just, it, it, I can't even, I, there's no other way to put it other than it's just, um, it, it's just an incredible, incredible, uh, increase. And, um, and, and, and again, we just rely on it way too heavily. Um, there's really nothing that we can do about it. And so that's where, you know, there's kind of like a two part to this, you know, not only does it suck that like gas is going to probably stay six to seven bucks a gallon for, for at least the foreseeable future. But in addition, you know, this is kind of a, you know, this is typically like the warning shot or the preemptive, uh, you know, hello, we're, we're going into a recession, which that blows even, you know, that obviously sucks as well. All right, so that's up with oil, but um, do you have any expectation for certain sectors uh, upcoming? I mean, right now, obviously, you, we talked about them buying uh, defense stocks, um, but I mean, other than that, we, we really don't have too much going into the summer now. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, pretty much, not, not too much. Um, you know, energy and energy. You know, obviously, going off of oil, energy is going to be a big, going to be a big one for me to watch. Um, also, another one is uh, another one is going to be value stocks. You know, let's start to see if uh, let's start to see if value stocks start to get some momentum. Um, because again, is that most of the the market comes down to supply and demand. So if uh, if, if, when we talk, when we think about supply and demand, you know, if 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 a lot of money is moving into these values defensive stocks, which like even fucking Kathy Woods was buying defensive stocks, which is ridiculous, um, you know, then that typically, you know, that typically signals stuff. So you know, your uh, your healthcare stocks, you know, your 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 dividend paying stocks, stuff like that. That's all stuff that's uh, that's uh, important. And those can be ones that, you know, I'll keep an eye on because, you know, at the end of the day, like we don't want to fight the trend. And so, you know, I'm okay with, uh, you know, with, I I'm okay with, with not swinging anything right now, primarily, but you know, I, I would like to swing some stuff. And so if some of these charts start to break out on the daily time frame, you know, I, I want to be there for that. Yeah, no, uh, it's definitely still not a swingers market. Um, it's, it's it's a shock to uh, I think just so many people because of uh what they were accustomed to in the first few years of trading. But um, would you consider this the real market or is this just a shitty one that we're getting right after a fucking great one? Even oh, though no, this is a shitty one to yeah. kind of yeah, yeah for your first no, this for is... your first normal market. Yeah, not not exactly the best to learn with. Yeah, no, th this is uh this is straight uh. Well, I'm trying to say like gulag. Like this is just straight uh, decimation. I mean, especially you know. Hopefully, it's kind of over. But when you saw those individual stocks just getting smoked, I mean, some of those stocks that, that have gotten smoked over the past few months. I mean, they they beat earnings and they were down twenty five percent. What? Uh, and th this is why, like you know, like like the dot com bubble. This reminds me a lot of the dot com bubble. And, uh, and, and, you know, with the dot-com bubble, it was kind of similar, you know, nobody cared about fundamentals and then, uh, and then, then all of a sudden they had to care. And, um, and, and this is, you know, a similar situation in, in my opinion to where, you know, I mean, like, like, what was it? Like Coinbase trading at like $40 billion market cap. Like what the, f like that has no business being up there. Same with like Neo. Neo didn't move for years. And all of a sudden it goes like, 1500 you know like they get stuff like, like that like Zilla, fucking the, Rivian. the cartoon company that had going from like yep. 25 cents to like 20 dollars yeah exactly carve carve went uh went to like 40 dollars from like a few cents because of juneteenth uh and and so so like like none of that means like fundamental you know what i mean like like so so you know it's just it's just honestly insane um it, it, or, or like Rivian, you know, like Rivian IPO to like 80 bucks a share ha, and, and some like crazy valuation, like, uh, like some crazy valuation, like, um, like I think it was like $30 billion valuation or something. And, and it has zero in revenue, zero. That is, that is, I mean, we're going to look back on this and, and go nuts. All right. Well, 
I guess we'll figure it out as we go. Um, we do have Juneteenth coming up, which BLM tickers uh, do tend to run. I, I saw Tommy tweet about it. First, I'm thinking about that in a while. But um, I guess we'll start to see if like tickers like that are still running. Like when I mean, you got to think like, do you remember during the presidential uh, debates when a fly landed on like Biden's head and like F or Mike Pence's head and, and FLY yeah. went crazy the next day? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, like it's just it's just wild. All right, well, we'll figure it out as we go, fellas. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your week and take care and be great. Penny's Going in Raw is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey guys, if you're tired of trimming your stocks too early, well, let me tell you something. Never worry about trimming anything early ever again with Manscaped. Let me tell you about their performance package 4.0. It comes with free boxers, a toiletry bag, and free shipping with a little discount when you use code PGIR. I mean, it comes with the razor you need, the sprays you need. I mean, dude, I, I mean, obviously, clearly I can't show you guys what's going on down there, but if I could, man, you guys would be amazed. Wireless charging, it's waterproof. Take it in the shower for all I care. I mean, it's going to get you right. It's got the light. It, man, the Lawnmower 4.0 is the best trimmer I have ever used. And, and that's not all it comes with. It comes with hella other shit. Like I, the boxers, I, I mean, look, I get it. Not all of us are boxer guys. Give it to your girl, she'll like them too. But man, when it comes with the, the weed whacker, that shit's for your nose or ears. I mean, you could, God, Manscaped has something for every hole and crevice of your body. So make sure to use code PGIR on manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping. That's code PGIR on manscaped.com.